to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Welcome to our study of Evangelism Encourages Faithfulness. These series of lessons are designed to promote Christians and encourage Christians to be faithful until death. And friend, one of the greatest ways to encourage, to promote faithfulness among God's children is for us to get busy doing the work of evangelism. The more you think about the lost and the more you study your Bible and prepare to answer the critic, the more that's going to encourage you to be faithful until death. Think about all the lost people there are in this world. Most, Jesus said, of this earth's population of the six billion people that exist are one day going to be lost. Look at what Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who find it. But then Jesus said this, Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. We need today to be evangelistic minded because Jesus said most people are going to go down the wrong path that leads to eternal destruction and will spend their eternity in the flames of hell. And so yes, we've got to be minded toward evangelism. But not only should that motivate us that most people are going to be lost, but the wonderful blessings of being a child of God ought to motivate us to want to tell others about Jesus. The Bible says all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. The child of God has the blessings that have been given from heaven, all the blessings you read about in the Bible, the peace, the love, the mercy, the hope of heaven, all of that is available to the Christian. And friend, don't you want others to have that same blessing? The victory is ours. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want other people to have the blessings found in Christ. I want others to escape torment and find the victory that Jesus provides. If that's the case, then I need to be evangelistic, and in so doing, it's going to encourage me, promote me to be even more faithful to the cause of Christ. And so today we want to think about the command that God has given us to evangelize, how that that's something each child of God must take seriously. We then are going to look at some things that if we're not careful, we'll cause us not to be as evangelistic as we ought to. And then we want to sum it up by noticing the motivation. What is it that really motivates me to want to get out and tell others about Jesus? Notice the command. The Bible teaches from several passages that every Christian has an obligation to evangelize. In Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus, as he had just told his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He then said, go and make disciples of all nations. Friend, that is not a command for the few. It's not a command for those who like doing it or those who feel like they're good at it. That's a command for everybody. I am Jesus' disciple also if I continue in His Word. John 8 verse 31. Listen to the words of Colossians chapter 1 in verse 24. Paul said, Him, Jesus we preach, warning every man, teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I have the responsibility as a disciple of Christ, as a learner, and every man needs to hear the gospel. The command is found also as we look at the fact that the Bible teaches that this command, uh, the Bible teaches that evangelizing, it's no different than any other command and it's a failure to do God's will in our life. Ask yourself, can I really, can I do the will of God 
and ignore what God teaches about evangelism? Jesus said, if anybody wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. You've got to know the doctrine to do God's will, and you have to be willing to follow that in your life. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46 to certain Jews who were wanting to maybe give credence to some of the things he was saying but not really follow him, Jesus said this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? He asked this question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Friend, the clear principle is if we claim Jesus is our Lord, and we claim to do His will, then we've got to realize that evangelism is part of God's will for us. And if we are lax in doing that, if we're not willing to do that, we haven't done God's will in our life. This command, the command to evangelize, is no different than any other command God's given us. All of us would say that there is the command, for example, to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. We realize that's a command for everybody. All of us need to study. How's Mark 16, 15 any different than that? Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Just like the command to study, so is the command to evangelize. And so it is a command for me. And I cannot be pleasing to God if I'm not willing to follow that. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 teaches that Jesus himself is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Evangelism is part of obeying God and remaining faithful to him. But friend, evangelism also, the command, when I follow that, it demonstrates my faith, my real faith in God and his word. A failure to evangelize is a lack of faith in God and his word. Think about what God said in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. The scripture teaches that God himself has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those who are lost. If God chose the foolishness of preaching and Romans 10 teaches that they can't hear without a proclaimer, a teacher, then my friend, if I've got faith in the gospel, then I've got to have faith in the system of evangelism that God chose. And that's door to door, house to house, every Christian telling his friend and neighbor about the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by the word of God. Do I have faith? in evangelism. James 1 verse 21, the scripture says we're to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save souls. Do I have faith in the word of God to save souls? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1 verse 16, do I really believe God's word will save and am I bold enough to stand up and say what God says on the matter. And so evangelism says, you've said it, God. I know it's true. I'm going to have faith in your word to save and in your method to reach the lost. But friend, also realize the command to evangelize can clearly be seen in the fact that when I do that, that demonstrates real love for lost people. Ask yourself, do you love the lost? And I'm not asking you, do you have a, a deep concern for those who are lost. What I mean is, do you love the lost enough to do something about it? Do you love the lost enough to actually get out and let them know that they're lost, that God has a plan of salvation, and that we want them to be saved? Think about the words of, of Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. Jesus looked out across the multitude because they were sheep without a shepherd. He loved them, and he said, Truly the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts will send laborers into his harvest. Jesus said, If you see these people and love them, you need to realize they need help. Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and Jesus looked on that man and loved him. And he said, one thing's lacking. You need to go do this to be right in God's sight. Jesus had real love and compassion for the lost. And, and if I say, I love the lost, I don't want them to go to hell, I want them to be saved, I need to realize to prove that, 
to prove that. I must be willing to reach out and tell them about their lost state, the love of God, and how to be saved. Now, when we think about evangelism, sometimes there are some things that, if we're not careful, will hinder us from doing evangelism like God wants us to. One of those is the fact that people say, well, evangelism, you know, that's good, that's a biblical principle, but that's somebody else's business. Now, what if everybody said that? What if everybody said, yeah, we need to evangelize and we need to get people to do that and that's a great thing, but that's somebody else's business. I'll let somebody else take care of that. What if we said that about everything else? Uh, reading the Bible is somebody else's business. Praying, that's good, but that's somebody else's business. Uh, taking the Lord's Supper, I like the idea of that, but that's somebody else's business. What if we took that attitude with everything? The church would never be what God intended for it to be if everybody took the attitude that somebody else needs to be doing that. I need to realize I am that somebody. It is my business to go about and spread the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 2 verses 49 through 52, I've got to be about the Father's business. What was His business? Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost and that business is also something I must do in my own life. And so let's not say to ourselves, well, I'm not as good as somebody else, or I don't feel comfortable about it, and so that's somebody else's business. That's a cop-out, and that's a failure to do God's will in your life. Another hindrance is some say, well, evangelism, you know, that, that stuff you read about in the New Testament about evangelism and going and telling people they're in sin and they need God's love and mercy and salvation, that just won't work today. Our society's changed. People need, that, that's, not the kind of, that's not the way you approach people today. Friend, that is foolish human wisdom that is going to cause a multitude of people to go to hell. Listen to the words of God in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God's ways don't change. Our ways do. God's ways doesn't. Look in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, and notice what God says here. God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Is God way, God's way better than man's way? Man sometimes says evangelism, like in the New Testament, won't work. God's ways are higher than my ways. Here's why. The seed of the kingdom is still the Word of God. Luke 8 verse 15, the gospel is still God's power unto salvation. Romans 1 16, the Bible says that the Word of God is still living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4 verse 12, and just as they did in the first century, daily and from house to house, they ceased not teaching and preaching Jesus was the Christ, Acts 5 verse 42, so we also need to do today. Just like in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, we need to do the same thing today. We don't need to say to ourselves it won't work. God said it will. God's ways are higher than mine. I need to step in line behind the will of God and stop making excuses and realize it will work. But you know there's another hindrance to evangelism that if we're not careful we'll get in the way and that is immoral living. Immoral living will do a great deal to hinder evangelism. If you're going to evangelize, you need to do your best to live a good, moral Christian life. Listen to what Jesus said, and notice this passage. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I am to be a light to the world. If I've got sin in my life or I'm living in the lust of flesh or chasing the passions of this world and claiming to be a Christian, that's going to hinder people wanting to be saved. Romans 1 verse 18 teaches God's wrath is against people who are living in ungodliness. It makes God angry and He promises to punish that. You know, one of the things Jesus hated the most was those who were hypocrites in his day and age. Matthew 15, verse 7, Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. In Matthew 23, he condemned the Jews. Hypocrites, you do all these things and then you go and do else. You go and make a proselyte and you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. Why? Because they were saying and they did not do. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 3. And so, if we're going to evangelize, we need to do our best. This doesn't mean we won't sin. This doesn't mean that we're going to be an example of perfection at all times. But we need to live a good, moral, Christian life. 
as best we can. But here's another hindrance to evangelism. Sometimes we're hindered to doing evangelism because we don't have the knowledge of God's Word that we need. Oh, how sad it is when people who have been in the church 10, 20, 30 years can't even tell their neighbors about God's plan of salvation and why denominational error is not true. The strongest rebuke in the Bible is found in Hebrews 5 verse 12. I believe the Hebrew writer says this. He says, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Those people had been Christians long enough. They should be out teaching others, partaking of solid food, and they needed somebody to teach them again. They were babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 4. We need to study so that we can tell others about Jesus. The Bible says this. In 1 Peter 3 verse 15, here's the command Peter gives to Christians. Peter says, But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. I am to be ready to give an answer for the reason I'm a Christian, the reason of my hope. Now that doesn't mean I've got to be ready to give an answer on every various subject, on the, the, the images in the book of Revelation or every figure in the book of Daniel or the baptism for the dead. That's not the kind of things we're talking about. In this context he's dealing with, you be ready to give an answer for why you've got the hope of being a Christian. And friend, if you can't do that after having been a Christian a while, Something is very wrong in your life. You need to be able to tell others why you're a Christian and how they can become one. That's what it really means to follow Jesus and be an example to the world. Now, as we think about hindrances, I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can also be hindered by not having the real genuine concern that we ought to in our lives. It is sad indeed that some people choose to live in sin and choose to reject the will of God. But friend, I can't let that multitude of people who choose to do that affect those who might be searching for the truth. If I say to myself, well, most of the world's going to hell in a handbasket and they wouldn't hear the gospel even if I preached it to them, and so there's no need for me to go out there. Well, wow, you're going to miss out on people who would want to hear the gospel. Is it true most are going to reject it? Yes. But friend, are there people who are searching for the truth? Absolutely. And we cannot let those who have a disdain for the Word of God or apathy towards Scripture cause us not to have the genuine concern that we should for lost people. Like Jesus, we need to feel compassion and sorrow for those living in sin. Now, since it is a command of God for me to evangelize, and, and since I can remove and see what might hinder me from being more faithful in evangelism, let's sum it up today by asking, well, what then is it that will motivate me? Once I understand the command, once I know I need to do it, and I'm trying to do my best to live a good Christian life, what is it every day, every time I see someone who's lost, every time I notice someone who's living in sin, what is it that will motivate me to you know, come out of my shell and be bold and courageous and tell them about Jesus? Here are some things I think that ought to motivate each of us. I believe the sacrificial love of God ought to motivate us to say something about Jesus. How can you look at God's love found in Scripture and not feel compelled to tell others about that? For example, notice the words of Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Paul said, when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at the love of God. When man was at his worst, while we were still sinners, God sent His Son to die for us. How can you look at that love, see lost people who've never come in contact with the blood of Jesus, and not say something? The love of Christ compels us. 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 14. John 3 verse 16, we read about how God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am God's, mean and God's means and God's tool for reaching people with that love. Each of us is. If God is love, 1 John 4 verse 8, and if it's the fact that Jesus left heaven and came to this earth to die for the whole world, 
and God has chosen me and you Christians to spread the word, how can we really say, I appreciate, I'm thankful for the love of God, and then never say anything about Jesus? Isn't that a contradiction? If I really understand the depths by which God expressed His love to mankind, then I'm going to want to tell others about that. Here's another motivation. I believe if we are motivated by genuine love for other souls, we will tell them about God's plan of salvation. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Paul uses this as one of his motivations in evangelism. The Bible says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Paul said earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 following, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade them because we realize what a benefit and a blessing it is to get a clean slate, a second chance. Do we really have genuine love for other people's souls? The greatest commandment. Jesus was asked by a lawyer in Mark chapter 12, What's the greatest commandment? If there's one commandment above all else, what is it? Well, Jesus responded by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then he followed it up and said, And the second like unto it is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you want to go to hell? If you were lost in sin, would you want somebody to tell you? If you were going to spend the eternity in the fires of that horrible place known as hell, would you want others at all cost and all expense, regardless of whether you liked it or not, to tell you about salvation? Absolutely. The greatest commandment, love God. The second, love your neighbor as yourself. Can you really say you love your neighbor and allow them to live in sin and go to hell and remain silent on the subject of their soul? Then I think the motivation for us also is realizing the horror of what that place called hell is going to be like. I am convinced that people today are not aware how horrible hell is going to be. One of the motivating factors for me for evangelism is, number one, I don't want to go to hell, but secondly, I don't want anybody to spend eternity in a place like that. What kind of place is it? Think about Mark chapter 9, verse 44. Jesus said this, Hell is a place where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. That word worm, we would translate that maggot. It's like a place where there's a continual maggot eating at your flesh and nobody ever cuts the AC up. Friend, I want you to think about the horror of that place. Jesus described it as a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the only comfort they have. It's described as a lake of fire. It's such a horrible place that for comfort, the rich man wanted just one drop of water. He said, I'm in torments in these flames. Nobody wants to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go there. Because of the reality and the horror of hell, I want to tell others whether they understand it, whether they get their feelings hurt or not. I want them to know God loves them. There is a way of salvation, and their life needs to be changed for the better. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 46, the righteous, yeah, they're going to go away into eternal life. The unrighteous, they're going to go away into eternal death. But then, on the positive side of that, not only do I think hell is a motivating factor, but I think the beauty and the splendor of heaven ought to motivate us to tell others about God's salvation. Oh, I don't want people to be lost, but you know what? I do want them to go to heaven also. John 14, verse 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings. Were it not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. I want people to spend eternity in heaven with God and with the saints of old. I want people to understand it's a place of rest. Hebrews 4 verse 9. It's a place where all the sin and the sorrow and the death of this world no longer exist. Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4. It's a habitation made by God. Hebrews 11. It's a place that has eternal foundations that will never be cast away. 2 Corinthians 5 1 and 2. And it's a place where we'll worship and stand around the throne and praise God and be edified 
for eternity, Revelation 4 and 5. And so because of the beauty and the splendor of heaven, I want people to know about Jesus. But here's another reason. A final motivating factor for evangelism has to be the brevity of life. Friend, look at life. It's so brief, it's so short, it passes by in just the blink of an eye. Because life is so brief, we don't need to delay in telling others about God's salvation. We need to see the urgency. Think about Philip and the Ethiopian nobleman. He's traveling down the road. Uh, the Holy Spirit tells him to go and talk to this man, and he runs over there and tells him about the gospel. There's an urgency because of the brevity of life in spreading. That's a motivating factor. These people, these neighbors of mine, these friends of mine who've never obeyed God may die in sin tomorrow or at any moment and be lost. James 4 verse 14 says, what's your life? Here's what it's like. It's like a vapor. Here for a little while, then it vanishes away. The Greek word there for vapor is the word we'd probably use for dew or a mist. You go out in the morning, there's a dew. Sun comes up and it's gone like that. That's what life's like. It's like a vapor. Here for a little while, then it vanishes away. Hebrews 9, 27 guarantees each person this. It's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. We've got 70, maybe 80 years as a, as a standard, but that's not even given. Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12. Our life is short and brief. We cannot boast about tomorrow, for we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Proverbs 27, verse 1. And so what motivates us? To tell others about Jesus, the love of God does. Genuine concern for other people's souls. The horror of hell, the beauty of heaven, and the brevity of life ought to motivate me to take evangelism seriously. Friends, I believe this is one of the things we've missed out on that we're not really doing as much as we should in the kingdom of God to reach others. And I can promise you, if you take evangelism seriously, it's going to encourage, to promote, to help you to be more faithful to God. It's going to challenge you to study. It's going to help you see the real meaning of life. It's going to tell you what God wants you to do in this life in the clearest sense. That's what life is all about. And so our prayer and our hope for you is that you will be faithful unto death. Never, ever give up. Don't let Satan into your life and be sure that you do what God wants you to in the realm of evangelism. God loves each one of us. And more than anything, He wants us to go to heaven. And friend, we love you. And we want you to go to heaven. May you always obey the gospel of Christ in your life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.